Hey, I am Jason. I'm 55 years old, and at 52, I was diagnosed with stage four metastatic prostate cancer that had metastasized to my spine. And on this channel, we talk about it. Today, we're going to be talking about vitamin D. Uh, there's, we're going to talk about two different studies. The first one I want to talk about is a study done where the biology of what vitamin D might do to help us uh, looks promising, but we don't always, just because the biology looks promising doesn't mean it's always going to have the expected outcome. So vitamin D. Vitamin D is discussed in prostate cancer a lot. In cancers in general, you see, you go to the, the Facebook you, uh, Facebook forum, cancer forums, cancer support forums, and uh, a lot of people recommend vitamin D. Lots of vitamin D, do lots of vitamin D to prevent cancer, to stop your cancer, stop progression. Well, these are, what do we call them, anecdotal evidence. I think it does this because of this. And what we have now is a trial, uh, like a double blind clinical, no kidding trial. So anyway, I'm jumping ahead. Vitamin D, vitamin D is talked about in, is in cancer conversations and when people have cancer, when they're talking about, hey, how do I fight this? What we know is that it's tied to immune regulation, it's tied to inflammation, it's tied to cell growth control. And we have a lot of observational anecdotal things out there that suggest uh, High vitamin D doses might be associated with lower cancer risk and delayed progression. So patients, people, uh, can people with cancer all regularly ask, "Hey, can vitamin D slow my prostate cancer progression?" But the biological plausibility doesn't mean fact, right? And so what this trial tested it was a phase two, double blind, randomized clinical trial. And that's that's important to understand because this is this is no kidding. This is these these are facts. This is data. Uh, it was 123 men. I'd like that it was a, a larger sample size, but they had 123. They were aged 50 to 80. They were newly diagnosed. They had low to intermediate risk localized prostate cancer. Low to intermediate risk localized. So that means they're in a situation where they can do active surveillance. And that was the goal here. All the participants of this study, uh, they were managed with active surveillance. They did this for two years. They conducted this study over two years. So some men received a placebo. Other men received a monthly oral dose of 50,000 IUs of vitamin D3 instead of the placebo. 50,000 I use. So I take vitamin D3 every day and I take about three of these 1,000 IU pills. And I often get recommendations, no, you need to bump that up to 5,000. You need to bump that up to 10,000 a day. So this 50,000 I use uh, per month, you know, that's not much over a thousand a day. Is so I don't know. So I have some hesitation. That, like that, of all the, of everything in this study, that's my only hesitation. Is I wish they would have done like five thousand IU's a day. Either way, what they what here? What were they looking for? They were looking for timed active treatment, and they were looking for progression free survival. So here's the clinical results. I'm not going to make you wait to the end. This is this is what it found. No difference between the vitamin D patients and the placebo patients. There was no delay in treatment initiation. There was no reduction in cancer progression. That's the clinical result. However, however, and this, I hope you stick around for this. This is important. They, the trial could have ended there, but they took a look at something else. They said, okay, this is unexpected. We didn't expect this outcome. What, but it must be doing something, right? So they looked beyond the clinical outcome. They took, they, they then asked a secondary question. They said, hey, if the vitamin D doesn't slow the cancer, is there some other benefit? Does it change any underlying biology? So what they measured were markers of gene damage, gen genomic damage in blood cells. So this is where something called CBMN markers come in. All right, CBMN. 
cytokinesis block micronucleus cytome assay. Okay, there's a bunch of words. What does it mean? It measures DNA damage and chrom chromosome uh, instability in lymphocytes. So what does, that, what does that even mean? It means it measures DNA strand breaks. It measures uh, chromosome uh, mess-ups. It measures uh, when the DNA tries to get repaired, tries to, the body tries to repair the DNA strand breaks. Sometimes it doesn't do very well. Sometimes it's inefficient or faulty. And so those three things are important because those three things are precursors to what we know to be cancer, right? How does cancer come about? Well, you have DNA strand breaks, you have chromosomal anomalies, or if you have a break and your body tries to repair it, it does it screwed up. And those things replicate and at some point, some something grabs and it says, okay, uh, I'm going to replicate this and it replicates and it replicates and it replicates and it's a precursor to tumor growth. So uh, my notes here say it's an uh, genomic instability is an upstream driver of cancer development. So what that means is lower CBMN markers suggest reduced ongoing DNA damage. Okay, that makes sense to me. If I have reduced DNA damage, I'm less likely in the future to get other cancers, right? Um, in fact, it's important for people on active treatment because I'm on Lupron. I'm hoping to go to Firmagon here uh, on my January shot. Today's December 23rd, 2025, and I got my next shot uh, January 7th. And uh, what was my point there? I forgot what I was saying. Oh, Lupron. When, when you're on an active treatment like Lupron and, and uh, Zytiga and prednisone, it drives your lymphocyte levels down, it, which means and T, your killer T cells are a part of your lymphocytes. It's, it's a small subset of your lymphocyte measurement. And if you have lower overall lymphocytes, you have lower overall killer T cells. You have a lower overall ability to fight uh, anything, uh, diseases, sickness, whatever, uh, mutations. We're, we're, we are immunocompromised on active treatment. And so if we can take vitamin D3 and reduce the CBMN markers, are the DNA and chromosome damage, that is a precursor to future tumor, tumors, then that makes sense to me, right? Uh, so let's I get back to my notes, I'm babbling. Um, some CBN markers declined in the vitamin D group. So this suggested reduced systemic DNA damage, but in the two year timeline, it didn't uh, delay pro uh, prostate cancer progression. It didn't delay time to treatment. It didn't delay any uh, clinical outcome. Um, but there are lowered DNA damage markers. So why does it, why didn't that translate to um, cancer control, controlling the cancer, re minimizing progression, redu you know, uh, reducing all that? So there's a lot of things you could you could postulate uh, affect this. The CBN mark CBMN markers were measured in blood, not in the prostate tissue. The men already had established cancer and reducing the background DNA damage doesn't reverse the existing malignant cloning of the, the tumor cells. Also, the, the size of the group was modest. I mean, 123, it's decent. Um, and then it was two years. So the follow-up window uh, was probably too short to see the long-term effects of uh, vitamin D supplementation. So, but remember, these are other facts about vitamin D. It's reason it's important for bone health. If you're on treatment and you're you're worried about bone health, this can uh, help improve uh, loss of bone. Right. Um, the and the, my closing takeaway. So this was a well-designed negative trial, uh, which is important because 
It's not anecdotal evidence. This isn't, you know, I think or I feel. This is actual clinical evidence. Um, and it's important that out of that evidence, they identified that some marker, it reduced marked uh, DMA, DNA damage and chromosomal damage. So I take vitamin D3 every day. I can I plan to continue to do so. I may bump it up to five five thousand I use because there's still a lot we don't know. And reducing DNA damage is almost certainly better than not reducing it. Uh, that doesn't make vitamin D a cancer therapy, but it's an interesting supportive thing, right? Now that's the first study. There's a second study, and this came out. I got to shift my view, my gaze to my other notes. Um, there was an article that came out in, oh, and let me say, so this study was published in URO, URO, Urology, right? URO Today. It's a weekly um, uh, newsletter that I get in my email, and it has lots of different sections, lots of different urology things, right? Kidney and whatever. Uh, but there's almost always a prostate cancer section with a lot of articles for prostate cancer. So look for uh, URO today and sign up for that. I think you'll find a lot of interesting information. At it. Shift to another study. Uh, this came out in, um, what was it? November 19th, they sent out uh, an article saying that a study was presented at the American Heart Association scientific session. And if you're interested in the abstract number to find that study, it's 4382525. Again, 4382525. And what it shows, and, and to be to be clear here, this is not a double blind randomized clinical trial. This is more of a um and a, a little bit more anecdotal observational. Anyway, let me get back to it. Uh, it shows that vitamin D supplementation was associated with a 52% lower risk of heart attack over four years. So they took 630 adults with acute angina. Oh, I'm, I'm reading the wrong notes now. 630 adults with acute angina, and they followed them for four years. About half had, a pri had had a prior heart attack. One group had vitamin D levels measured and treated. And what they targeted is uh, blood levels of 40 to 80 nanograms per milliliter, which means they measured them. They did a blood test, measured the vitamin D3 levels, and 85%, oh, and where'd that number go? 85% of everybody measured was deficient. They were below that target level. And so they had to treat them and they treated them to get them into that range and then watched them. And they had a 52% lower risk of heart, heart attack after getting them into the right range. In patients with a prior heart attack, risk of a second event was reportedly reduced by more than 50%. These are huge numbers. This is important. Why is it especially important? Why am I talking about it to you guys? Well, Lupron, right? One of the side effects, one of the reasons I'm going to try and get off of Lupron and go to Firmagon, even though Firmagon's reportedly a really a much nastier shot and I have to get it every month, is long-term side effect of Lupron is cardiac damage, uh, increased risk of uh heart attack, increased risk of cardiac events um, at the, not this last year, not 2025, but at 2024, when I went to the prostate cancer support group leader, zero cancer uh, event, they, the panel talked about, they did a presentation and one of those things that they talked about was a lot of men in long, in that are dealing with long-term metastatic disease that are on Lupron, um, there's a significant number that don't die of the cancer. They die of cardiac issues that develop as a side effect of it. So circle that, all, all that information comes back to vitamin D3. Okay, well, if I can reduce that risk with vitamin D, why wouldn't I just take that stupid, silly pill every day? 
Um, and then Dr. Jacob Tiedelbaum, who did put this study together, he noted that vitamin D levels often fall when during illness, right? Inflammation, which we're dealing with, and uh, it it makes it makes it even more important that we get our levels back into normal. So this wasn't a full peer reviewed publication. This was uh, more of a conference abstract. Um, let's see, very large risk reductions from a single nutrient are uncommon, so we have to interpret that carefully. Uh, but man, that's promising, right? So vitamin D deficiency is common. Like they took that sample of 630 men and 85% of them were deficient. Well, you put that, you know, put that number out to the, to the, your, your city, your, your city or town, your state, your community, uh, your country, the, the world. And imagine how many people are vitamin D deficient. And we have increased apparently increased cancer cases, right? And vitamin D, uh, low vitamin D levels can, if you infer from the first study, if being having higher vitamin D reduces DNA damage, then low vitamin D causes in, uh, higher levels of damage. That's that's interesting, right? Yeah, so it's not a, a uh, vitamin D is not a substitute for cardiovascular risk management. But, but if you're not taking vitamin D, uh, and I do vitamin D3 with plus K2, if you're not doing a vitamin D supplement, after hearing about all the information from these studies, these both these, these studies, these two studies, I strongly suggest you think about it. I'm not a doctor right? <laughs> We're not talking about treatment here. We're talking about, hey, what can I do to improve my odds? Um, and for me, with my odds, I want reduced DNA damage. I want reduced chromosomal damage. I want, I want to improve my chances because I know I'm uh, immune compromised. And I want to improve my uh, improve my chances of not having a heart attack. I feel like there's a better way to say that. <laughs> All right. Today's December 23rd, 2025. It's Christmas Eve Eve. For those of you that celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas. For those that don't, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays. Um, yeah. I hope everybody's getting some time with family. I recently went out to Minnesota and spent some time with my first grandbaby, and that was awesome. Um. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Love you all. <laughs>